Now, let me just read today's uh, scripture passage. We're in Mark chapter 12, and we're reading from verse 13 uh, down to the end of the chapter. Mark chapter 12, verse 13. And they sent to him, Jesus, some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are true and do not care about anyone's opinion, for you are not swayed by appearances, but truly teach the way of God. Is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them or should we not? But knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why put me to the test? Bring me a denarius, a coin, and let me look at it. And they brought one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they marveled at him. And Sadducees came to him, who say that there is no resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves a wife, but leaves no child, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. There were seven brothers. The first took a wife, and when he died, left no offspring. And the second took her and died, leaving no offspring. And the third likewise, and the seven left no offspring. Last of all, the woman also died. In the resurrection, when they rise again, whose wife will she be? For the seven had her as wife. Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. And as for the dead being raised, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham, and the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. He is not God of the dead, but of the living. You are quite wrong. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. And as Jesus taught in the temple, he said, How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself in the Holy Spirit declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And the great throng heard him gladly. And in his teaching he said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. And he sat down opposite the treasury and watched the people putting money into the offering box. 
Many rich people put in large sums. And a poor widow came and put in two small copper coins which make a penny. And he called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Amen. This is the word of God. Just ask Johnny to come up. And um, my thanks again to, to Kevin and to the musicians uh, and others who've been involved in the service so far. Now, we're going to be spending the rest of our time uh, thinking about uh, that passage that's just been read from one of the eyewitness accounts of Jesus' life, Mark's gospel. Um, and as ever, um, you might find it helpful to have that open in front of you over the next few minutes, whether in a paper copy of the Bible or on a phone or device. Um, before we think about it together for a few minutes, though, let me lead us in prayer. Let's pray together. The psalmist writes, Open my eyes that I may behold wondrous things in your law. We ask this morning, our speaking God, that you would please open each of our eyes over the course of the next few minutes that we would see wondrous things and so be changed. I ask these things in your precious name. Amen. Amen. Well, um, as we begin, uh, let me, as I occasionally do, um, ask a question of you. Um, what would it look like for you to give God his due in your life? What would it look like for you to give God his due in your life? That's the creator God, the God of the Bible. What would it look like to give him the right place in how you live I guess we might answer that kind of question in a number of different ways. One way we might answer it, perhaps, is that the way to honor God is to become more spiritually disciplined. You might spend more time reading the Bible, for example. You might know it inside and out. Perhaps even know it well enough to, to teach it to other people in various contexts. That's one answer, spiritual discipline. I asked uh, this question, though, to someone this week, someone who works in one of the businesses near to the, the, the building in which we're sitting right now, and uh, he gave a different answer to that one, though. Uh, the way to give God his due, according to, to this chap, is to be more charitable. Use our resources, whether, whether financial or time or energy, to spend more of those resources helping other people. Helping charities, perhaps, giving more of it to the church itself. That's how we give God his due in our lives, uh, we might think, by literally giving to him. Uh, well, as, as virtuous as, as discipline might seem, as, as charity is in our culture, spiritually speaking even, if those are the kinds of activities that spring to your mind when you think of God in, uh, giving God his due in your life, well, then you might be in for a bit of a surprise this morning. Because in Mark chapter 12, we're going to see that it's quite possible to know your Bible very, very well indeed. It's possible even to give bundles of cash away to other people, even. And yet, for Jesus to say of you, Mark chapter 12, verse 40, you will one day be condemned. Now, we're in the middle of a series in Mark's Gospel on Sunday mornings here at Hebron. And over the past two Sundays, we've read, as Kevin mentioned a moment or two ago, of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. And it's been made clear to us over those past two Sundays that he arrived both as God's long-awaited king and as God's authoritative judge. And both of those roles were a bit contentious for the religious elites in the city, but his next claim was enough to kick a hornet's nest. Because God's king, God's judge, pointed the finger of judgment first and foremost at God's temple. And particularly at the leaders of God's temple. At people who'd been entrusted to lead and to shepherd God's people, but who instead of giving God his due, had turned religion 
into something that served them. Now, that was chastening, I think, for the religious leaders in Jesus' day, at least it ought to have been. And it may well have been chastening for some of us, too, because we might not have been entrusted to look after and to steward at the temple. I'm guessing that none of us here have. But we do, each of us, live in God's world, don't we? A world in which everything was made by him, everything belongs to him, and that includes us. And the matter of whether we live as though that's the case, of whether we give God his due, is as much an issue for us as it was for the leaders of the temple. All of, us, all of which leaves us with that question. If failing to give God his due is so dangerous, says Jesus, both for the religious leaders of Jesus' day and for us today, well, what does it actually look like to give God his due? Because if you were to create a, a, a sort of a photo fit of someone who does give God their due, who does honor him, well, religious discipline and philanthropy or charity, well, they're going to be pretty high on the hit list, aren't they? And yet the sting of Mark chapter 12 is that appearances can be deceiving. It is possible to look like you're committed to God, to look like you're giving him due place in the world and in our lives, but in actual fact, to be in real trouble with him. Because you see, when it comes to following Jesus, as he would have us follow him, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. Let's think about that under our first heading this morning. Next slide, please, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, giving God his due, verses 13 to 17. Now, um, we rejoin the story in Mark 12. Immediately after, Jesus has called out the religious leaders for, for self-centeredness. And he's told them that they were storing up judgment for themselves in verses 1 to 12. And as a result of all of that, perhaps unsurprisingly, they aren't best pleased with Jesus. And so, verse 13, they sent to him some of the Pharisees and some of the Herodians to trap him in his talk. Their intention's quite clear. They mean to, to corner him. And they do that by posing what looks like an impossible question. Verse 14, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Should we pay them? Or should we not? Now, the reason that's such a tricky question is that it can't really be answered without picking a fight with someone. Because if Jesus says, yes, go ahead, you should pay those taxes, well, then all the people who are listening on, who themselves live in a country ruled by Roman occupation, are going to think I'm a collaborator, a mouthpiece of the state, if you like. But if uh, the opposite side of things, if he says, no, don't bother paying your taxes, well, he'll be accused of being a dissenter, a, a troublemaker. He, he might even be handed over to, to the authorities as a rebel. They think they have him cornered. No matter what he says, he's in bother. Or is he? Anyone here got a coin, he asks in response, verse 15. Whose picture is on that coin, he asks. Well, as they look, it's Caesar's picture, Caesar's inscription. They answer verse 16. Well, that answers it then, doesn't it? The coin belongs to Caesar. Give it to him. But not everything bears Caesar's image, does it? No, says Jesus. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's, what bears his image. But give to God... What is God's? Now, this passage from verses 13 to 17 is often understood by Christians to help us think about how to be involved in public life, uh, that we should pay our taxes uh, and be good citizens as far as we can, uh, but that ultimately our allegiances are to God, and there is a lot of truth in that. But I do wonder if you can see how our context in Mark chapter 12 allows us to narrow the scope of what's going on a bit further than that. Because the whole idea last week in verses 1 to 12 was that the religious leaders were not giving God his due. See, they were living in what was his, but not honoring him as they ought. And so this punchline in verses 13 to 17, give God what is God's, well, it's actually barbed. Barbed. 
Because you see, giving God what is God's is exactly what they were not doing. And so that is the big idea that hangs over the rest of chapter 12. What would it actually look like if they were to do that, if they were to give God his due, give him what is his? Now, there are generally two kinds of people in the world. Uh, On the one hand are people who, when it comes to any kind of menial task, follow the instructions that came with the box. And uh, on the other hand are the kind of people who try to wing it. Uh, who, who, who build things or who fix things without a second glance at the instruction manual. Uh, I've, I've slowly been migrating from the former to the latter. I'm using instructions for things more and more now. Uh, and that's mainly because a number of years ago, I attempted to build a flat pack bookcase and it ended up looking like a piece of modern art and, uh, and not in a good way. Uh, when the books are the only things holding the bookcase up, uh, you probably haven't done it right. Uh, and as I've started paying attention to those instructions, well, you come to see that there's, there's often a similar pattern to most of them. Firstly, there's generally a picture that shows you how not to do it. A picture of of a guy using a bandsaw to put his billy bootcase together. And that first picture usually has a bit of a sad face on it and a great big cross next to it so that even someone like me putting something together in a bit of a hurry should know to put the saw away. And next to that picture is the picture of the person doing it the right way who usually has a smile on their face, which, I'll be honest, is really my experience when putting flat-back furniture together. And that picture usually has a great big tick next to it. On the one hand, a picture of how not to do it. And on the other hand, a picture of how to do it right. And that's kind of how Mark structures the rest of Mark chapter 12. He interweaves a number of pictures Pictures of some people who don't give God his due, people who are getting it wrong, with pictures of people who are giving God his due or who are at least on the right lines. And so we're going to follow that pattern. We're going to think firstly about how to not give God his due. And the first way to do that is to make God's kingdom all about the here and now. Now, read on with me to verse 18. In verse 18 to 24, we're introduced to a group of people called the Sadducees. The Sadducees were a conservative Jewish group, very influential in their day. And one key thing that Mark would have us in mind about them is that unlike other Jewish groups at the time, verse 18, they don't believe in the resurrection. They don't believe that one day people will rise from the dead. And that created a bit of attention for the Sadducees, because in a culture where there was no welfare state, when a woman's husband died, that woman would often be left in a precarious financial situation. And so God had provided that that if a man died, rather than leaving a wife without means to support herself, that a man's brother could marry her and support her. And so the question the Sadducees asked Jesus, verses 21 to 23, is what happens if rather than seven brides for seven brothers, there is one bride for seven brothers? If seven brothers, one after the other after the other, each die after having married this one woman, well then what happens at the resurrection? When all seven of those brothers are raised to life again, to whom is the woman married? That's the question they asked Jesus. And in response, Jesus gives them both barrels. Verse 24, Jesus said to them, Is this not the reason you are wrong? Because you know neither the Scriptures nor the power of God. Now that's a very strong thing to say to a group of religious fanatics like the Sadducees, that they don't know the Bible and they don't know God's power. Because in one sense, well, the scriptures were were, were kind of their thing. They prided themselves on knowing them inside and out, and they spent a lot of time talking about them to know them better. And so not only does what Jesus says sound a bit harsh, perhaps, it also sounds as though it might not be entirely accurate. Until Jesus explains what he means. Verse 25. For when they rise from the dead... They neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. 
Their problem, the Sadducees' problem, says Jesus, is not so much that they don't know the words that the Scriptures say. It's that their reading of the Scriptures is, is just far too small, too short-term. See, they, they, they don't believe in the resurrection in this situation because they can't get their heads around the mechanics of how it will actually work. They're boxing God in, effectively. And that same idea carries on in verses 26 and 27. Even after they had died, Jesus says, God could speak of of great people of the past, like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, could speak of them even after they died, as though they still existed. Why? Well, because they did still exist. They didn't stop to exist just because they had died. Why? Well, because the resurrection will happen, says Jesus your view of God and of his purposes for the world, they're far too short term. And that tells us quite a lot about this group, the Sadducees, actually. It seems that the scriptures to them were a manual for this life only. Told them about what they could see and and, and touch and feel right now. But Jesus is saying that God's purposes are much, much bigger than that. Can you see? Of course, God's purposes matter in the here and now, but they also matter in eternity. And if you aren't convinced that that's quite what's going on, I appreciate it is. It does take a while to get our heads around what's happening in those verses. Well, a similar point is made again in verses 35 to 37. Just read on there with me. Before we do, though, there does come a time in everyone's life, I think, which it feels like a bit of a threshold of of growing up and growing old, when someone, perhaps in a shop or a restaurant, for the very first time, refers to you either as sir or as madam. Would you like the bill, madam? Would you like the receipt in the bag, sir? First time it was ever said to me, I felt like I'd just aged by about 20 years. But it is a way of indicating a kind of respect, a kind of deference for someone. And that's why it can kind of feel like a bit of a threshold in life, a marker that that you're maybe getting on a bit. Because it's usually the kind of respect offered from someone who's younger to someone who's older rather than the other way around. And it's that kind of dynamic that Jesus highlights in verses 35 to 37. Just read those verses with me. Verse 35. How can the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself, in the Holy Spirit, declared, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I put your enemies under your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So how is he his son? And now the scribes, another group of religious leaders, were of the view that God's coming king, his Messiah who he'd promised to send, would be a descendant, a son of King David, that great king of God's people from hundreds of years before. And so they expected that he would be a king much like David, that he would lead people in battle, that he'd rule over them politically, that that he would come in order to make Israel great again. But Jesus identifies a problem with that idea. See, in Psalm 110, the psalm that Kevin read for us earlier, David calls the king who was to come, who would come after him, Lord. Lord. And that's strange. It's, it's like a 40-year-old shopper calling the 18-year-old shop assistant, sir. See, the deference doesn't usually go from the older to the younger. It usually goes from younger to older. But you see, Jesus explains the reason that David showed deference to this coming king is that though he would be a physical descendant of King David... Will he be much, much more than that? He would also be the eternal son of God. He would be David's Lord. Now, it's just worth asking, why does Jesus raise that issue? And why does he raise it apparently unprovoked? Did you notice that? No one seems to prompt him to say any of what he says in verses 35 to 37. He just sort of comes out with it. Well, I think we're told about it here is, well, the reason we're told about it here is because we're dealing with a similar issue to the one before. 
these scribes, religious leaders, knowing the scriptures pretty well, but having a pocket-sized view of God's coming king. He'll be a king for the here and now, they think. A military ruler, a political ruler, a, a, a human king like David was. And Jesus is saying, no, 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 that's far too small. God's coming king is God himself, will be David's Lord. He'll be here to rule and to reign forever. Now, why does any of that matter? Why does it matter that the Sadducees and the scribes had started to make things too pocket-sized, too much about the here and now? Because things I'm conscious might sound a bit academic so far, and yet it really does matter that we get our heads around what they're doing. Because having too small a view of God's king, too short-term a view of his coming kingdom, has a devastating effect on how we view ourselves. And we see that in our next, how not to do it, making God's kingdom all about you. Read on with me, verse 38. And Jesus, in his teaching, said, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and like greetings in the marketplaces and have the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts who devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, they will receive the greater condemnation. You know, the presenting issue in verses 38 to 40 is, is hypocr- it's fairly obvious, hypocritical, self-serving religion. Being, being religious simply because of what is in it for you. Because it gives you some kind of spiritual kudos or power or authority over other people. But I wonder if you notice that behind that presenting issue is the same idea from those first two episodes. It's religion that has too short a time frame. Religion that's about self-service and self-importance now, and it fails to acknowledge that you're storing up trouble. Verse 40, trouble in eternity. And that makes sense in the wider context of Mark's gospel. You might remember, if you've been here over the past few weeks, that Jesus in Mark's gospel has given all people everywhere a choice. A choice about when to lose your life. Either, says Jesus, we can lay down our lives, hand them over and submit them to him now, in which case we'll take up true and wonderful eternal life in eternity, or we can hang on hang on to our lives in the here and now, and ultimately lose them in eternity. Now, in Mark chapter 12, if anyone looks like they're getting things right, looks like they're giving God his due and laying down their lives for him now, well, it's Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. It's a religious bunch of people. But Jesus is saying, appearances are so deceiving The scribe's view of God and his kingdom was far too small, far too short-term, and far too much about them. And as a result, they're trying to keep their lives now. Can you see? Getting all of the advantages, the spiritual kudos, the importance they could get now. And so we're going to lose their lives in eternity. Now that is fairly sobering stuff, I think. Not least as we think on our own acts of spiritual service to God. And on the sense of spiritual safety that we might feel as we think on those acts of service. I'm okay with God because I do X, Y, and Z for him. That's just not the case, says Jesus. But it does leave us with a bit of a problem, doesn't it? Because if it isn't always obvious from activity, from from how things look on the outside, well, how are we to know if we are giving God his due in our lives or not? Well, that's why this instruction manual is so helpful. Because Mark doesn't just tell us how not to do it. He also gives us a couple of pictures of how to do it, of how to give God his due. 
And those are where we're just going to spend the last few minutes of our time, how to give God his due, loving God and others devotedly. The first in our how to do it in Mark 12 comes in verses 28 to 34. We're introduced to a scribe, another scribe who again approaches Jesus, but unlike his peers, he asks what seems to be a genuine question of Jesus. Which commandment is the most important one? And the response Jesus gives to that question is is clear and concise. Love God, love your neighbor. And that's quite a famous answer, actually. You might have heard these verses before. But I wonder if you notice that after Jesus gives his answer, the man repeats it back to him. But as he repeats it back, he adds a bit of an addendum at the end. Did you see that? Verse 32, to love God and to love neighbor, verse 33, is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now, the scribe's point is not that making sacrifices and offerings to God were bad or were wrong. They were God's idea in the first place. God himself had given his people that system to live by. But you see, sacrifices and offerings by themselves, without love for God, without love for neighbor, well, that's dangerous territory. And it does help us to pinpoint what giving God his due does look like, doesn't it? Giving God his due may well, look like involve, uh, may well look like knowing the Bible pretty well. I suspect it actually will do, to be honest. Giving God his due will like, uh, look like being open-handed with our money and our stuff and our time and our resources, giving things to God, submitting ourselves to him. But it will look like doing those things in love. That's what scribes and Sadducees, for all their religious activity, were lacking. Love for God and love for his people. And all of that means that what matters when we think about how we give God his due in our lives is not just what we do. It's not just the way we serve. No, it's our motivations. It's our heart that really, really matters. Now, I've uh, said quite a number of times already from this platform in the seven or so months that we've been here uh, that Hebron is a wonderful and loving and caring church family. And I really do mean that. People go out of their way to love and care for one another and do so out of a love for each other and a love for God. We've benefited from that a lot as a little family since we've been here. And so in lots of ways, I think Mark 12 should be an encouragement to us to keep going, to keep loving God and loving one another. But it is also just worth doing a a sort of spiritual temperature check, an MOT, if you like, from time to time. Reflecting on not only what we do to serve God, but on our attitudes as we do so. Are there ever any hints of short-termism or of what's-in-it-for-me-ism in our Christian walks, however subtle? Perhaps we do serve in sacrificial ways, but we still find ourselves getting frustrated at other people, not seeming to be as committed to serving God as we are, or frustrated that they seem to take us for granted. Perhaps we give sacrificially to the work of the gospel or or just are open-handed with what God's given to us, but the problem is that no one ever seems to notice, and we don't get the credit that we're due See, the point of Mark 12 is that no matter how virtuous we might look, self-serving spiritual activity, spiritual activity that is actually all about me and has no love, is nothing. More than that, actually, it's dangerous, says Jesus. It results, verse 40, in condemnation. Now, that may well lead some of us to some circumspection, to some reflection, on our own walks with the Lord Jesus. But the tone of Mark 12 isn't only one of rebuke. 
That definitely is there. But Jesus does also want to win people over to love, I think, to, to, to serve God devotedly with a love for him and a love for people. And we see that in our final portrait, very briefly, our final exchange in this little unit, verses 41 to 44. Just read again with me, verses 43 and 44. Yet Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow has put in more than all those who are contributing to the offering box. For they all contributed out of their abundance, but she out of her poverty has put in everything she had, all she had to live on. Giving God his due may well involve giving our money to him, our stuff to him. But we do so devotedly and lovingly. Not in order to be seen by people, not because of what we'll get in return when we are seen by people, but because we love him. So let me just ask you to think on on what it might look like for you to give yourself to lovingly and devotedly commit yourself to God and to serve people. One big outbox of Mark 12 is that it might not actually look like doing anything you aren't already doing, at least not outwardly. It might not look like getting involved in another area of ministry or of church life or signing up for a rota. I mean, it might do, but it might not. No, it might instead look like doing what you're already doing, but doing it with a different heart set. Rather than because of what might be in it for you, or of, with a nagging sense that you aren't getting the credit that you're due from the people who are around you, doing it because you love God and you love other people. Now, if you're here this morning and wouldn't describe yourself as, as a Christian, you're most most welcome. We are so pleased to have had you here this morning, not least for a baptism Sunday. And I hope you can see from what we've been thinking about together this morning that at the very least, being a Christian following Jesus is not about white-knuckled religious duty. If you don't have love, says Jesus, spiritual activity is for nothing. But I also hope you can see that, that that doesn't actually make obedience to God any easier. If anything, it ramps things up. See, if you reflect honestly on your own life, whether you're a Christian or not, I guess that all of us would have to admit that the widow is not a portrait of what we always look like. That picture of devoted, wholehearted service to God. If she's the standard, then we fall short. And actually, that kind of idea, the idea that we all fall short, is is baked into Mark chapter 12. Just think back to what Jesus said to the scribe, who rightly identified loving God and loving your neighbor as the most important commandments. He said to him, verse 34, you are not far from the kingdom of God. Not you're in, but you're not far. And the reason he wasn't far but wasn't in is that none of us do this perfectly. Even if we know it's what we should be doing, we don't offer our lives to God perfectly and we don't love him and our neighbors as we ought. And the truth is that we can't make up the shortfall between not being far from the kingdom and actually being in ourselves. Only God can do that. But the good news is that in the most loving act in all of human history, he did. That's what we were thinking about in Aaron's baptism this morning, wasn't it? He made up the shortfall by dying on a cross to wash us clean, to make us right with him again. Now, if you're convicted this morning by your own failure to give God his due, by your own heart being far from him in your service of him and service of other people, well, it's a good thing to ask him for his forgiveness And it's a good thing to thank him that even though none of us love him as much as we should, that he has loved each of us more than we could possibly fathom. And if you have done that, if you're a Christian perhaps and are reflecting on your own inability to love God and know that you've been saved by his grace alone 
Well, even then, as we look to give God his due in our lives, it's important to note that we can't do it by ourselves. We need his help. And wonderfully, he promises to give us that help by his Holy Spirit, God himself living within us. And so if you are a Christian this morning and reading through Mark 12 convicts you of your need to grow in love, well, ask for his help to do that. Don't try and white-knuckle it or conjure it up inside yourself because it's not there. Ask God for his help. Mark 12 would have us on our knees before it would have us using our hands. Asking God for his forgiveness, for our lovelessness. Thanking him for his extraordinary love for us. And asking for his help to pursue this kind of love, to become more and more like our Savior and King, the Lord Jesus. So let me lead us as we do that together now. Let me lead us in prayer. Our God and Father, we come before you this morning and we confess. We confess our own failure to love you as we ought, to love others as we ought, and yet still to presume that our actions reflect some kind of spiritual maturity or spiritual safety in your sight. We ask that you would please forgive us And we thank you that because you are a perfectly loving God and you have been patient and kind to us, that you gave your son, the only perfectly loving human being to have walked the face of the earth, to save us, to rescue us from the judgment due for our rejection of you, and to promise us that one day, We will see you face to face, know you fully, and love you as you are. And so we ask now for your help, Lord Jesus. Please change us that we would love just as we have been loved and grow to be more and more like you in how we treat one another. We ask all of these things for our joy and for your glory. And we do so in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our King. Amen.